Professor Francis Fukuyama, welcome to the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Thank Policy. You very much. Thank you very much for agreeing this interview to do this interview for our school. I have a few brief questions for you. The first question, of course, is about uh, China's emergence. As you know, the IMF said that according to PPP terms, uh, China has now emerged as the number one economy in the world in 2014. How do you think that will change the world? Well, I think there's two respects in which things are going to change. So one has to do with the economy and who makes the rules, because up till now, it's really been the United States and to some extent the EU that have shaped the global order. And China has been a participant, but sometimes not that happy about the way the rules are structured. And I think with its greater impact, it's going to have to face up to the question of what kind of world does it want and what rules does it want to play by. Uh, the other aspect, uh, which I think is more dangerous, is the strategic one, because I think that in terms of power, uh, it's, it's, um, the history tells us that this is a, a potentially destabilizing situation where you have a rapidly rising power within an existing uh, uh, international system. And you, know, you had some unfortunate experiences with you know, the rise of Athens in ancient Greece and with the rise of Germany in the 19th century. And uh, we need a lot of wisdom to you know, ensure that we have a stable world order as a result of that. I agree. I agree. We need lots of wisdom, which leads me to my second question uh, about the United States. You know, in your latest book, you describe the American government as being dominated by, quote, interest groups that are able to effectively buy politicians with campaign contributions and lobbying, unquote. And as you know, the size of these lobbies has become much greater. Now, do you see a way to curb their influence and to sort of restore more balance to U.S.? Uh, policy making? I think that uh, interest groups uh, interact with the American system because we uh, give them a lot of opportunities to influence the system, and not all democracies do that. Mm. Uh, and I think you can change the rules. Uh, one of the most obvious ones is to reverse the Supreme Court decisions that basically say that spending money in politics is a form of free speech and therefore protected by the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which I think is an absurd decision. Uh, but our system is pretty conservative, and once the Supreme Court speaks, it's, it's hard to uh, change that. But I think you know, that, that's where I would start. Good point. Uh, you know, your book, we discussed China earlier. Uh, again, your book, the latest book, has been translated into Chinese and circulated, I believe, among the senior leaders in China. Uh, if you had to imagine them reading your book, <laughs> what impact do you think it will have on them? <laughs> Well, uh, the first volume and the second volume are a little different. The first volume, uh, I argue that China was really the first society in the world to create not just a state but a modern state that was bureaucratic and based on merit and rationally organized and so forth, and that they never really got credit, you know, I think, in Western scholarship for having done that, mm -hmm. and that it's a history that they you know, need to be quite proud of, uh, mm -hmm. and it goes back you know, quite, quite a ways. Uh, but I think there's also a certain warning in there because I think the thing that they didn't create were the institutions of constraint that limited uh, the, the you know, authority of, of governments uh, like the rule of law uh, and democratic accountability and that a just uh, and well-organized country really has to have a certain balance between the ability to use power and the ability to constrain power. So China, I think, is, is still not there yet. Great. All this leads me to the most important question of this interview. You know, there'll be lots of young people watching this interview, thinking about whether or not they should study uh, in a school of public policy. What advice would you give to these young people? Well, I think that any young person needs to want to make the world better, uh, you know, to, to make the world a better place in practical terms. And given the kind of world we live in, that means you have to affect it through public policy. I mean, there's other ways of acting on the world as well, but I think for the biggest effects, uh, you, you need to think about uh, how governments and, and populations interact, and that's what you learn in a public policy school, plus which I think there's a practical side to public policy, which you sometimes don't get in a more academic uh, kind of institution, and that's, I think, very valuable. Great. 
I think with those words of encouragement, I'm sure more people will apply to study at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. So thank you very much, Frank. Okay, thank, thank you for you. the interview. Thank you. Thank you.